So um, what I would like to do is introduce what we're, we're going to try to do this afternoon. Um, this is the third in a series of town halls that we've had addressing a couple of specific topics uh, within what we broadly call the clinical trials initiative. You know, sometimes people ask me, well, what is the clinical trials initiative? And I think that's our really enterprise-oriented effort to across the entire landscape, um, including everything in pre-award, conduct of the study, post-award, to see how we can do <clears throat> a better job. And we're gonna talk about, as two elements of that today, we're gonna talk about both pending accounts, which is a UAB local kind of operational issue, and then budgets, which is really applicable to everybody. And I think there are important things in both. They're slightly different. I'm looking around. Who picked up a 5226 button? Oh, gosh, there are more. It doesn't count if you don't have it on. <laughs> So you can put it on your collar, you can put it on a lapel. I'm sure there are other places you could put it, but those would probably be the two recommended places. Um, we'll come back to 5226, because those are actually real numbers that illustrate a couple of points. Um, but first I'd like to um, talk about pending accounts, and the goal is gonna be, I'm gonna make a couple of comments, and then we're gonna open things up for questions. When we've done the two previous town halls last week, uh, I had colleagues to help me out so that I could set up the questions and they would provide the answers. You have the opportunity of getting the answers for me, from me, and I have to see if I can actually bring the same level of insight that uh, Lakeisha Mack brought from the Dean's office, Mark Marchant from the CTAO, and Cindy Joyner from uh, the Department of Medicine. All three had other commitments at this time, but we said we are going ahead with this town hall. And with some trepidation, they said, Bob, see if you can do it. Rhonda, if I mess up, you will step in okay. and help me out because you know this drill. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, if I said, uh, if I ask, does everybody know what a pending account is? Uh, does everybody raise their hand? So I see two hands raised, three, four, five, every. Is there anyone who doesn't know what a pending account is? Perfect, perfect. So we can, uh, I can help, I'm gonna try to help. Is that okay? Does anyone know what an operating account is? Who doesn't know what an operating account is? I'm going to raise my hand there. Okay. Okay, so that's important because pending accounts and operating accounts are two different approaches to addressing the same issue. Okay? One operating account is really addressing the issue from the perspective typically of the PI because they're just some time and effort kinds of things that I think operating accounts solve but it at the same time solves the, quote, pending account issue. So let me start with a couple of other, can I, can I assume everybody here is, is involved in some ways in clinical trials? I'm looking for the gentleman in the light blue shirt leaning on the door back there who is here for a beer tonight. <laughs> I was promised burgers. <laughs> If you go to the, um, the, the sideboard in there, the uh, bottom right-hand drawer, um, <laughs> bottom left is Scott, bottom right is Urban. Um, so uh, if there are any issues, and here I, I actually want to be quite serious. If there are things you don't understand, or I'm not clear, maybe that's a better way of putting it, please ask. Because one of the reasons for having the town hall is a time to actually give us a chance to ask questions to make sure we're all on the same page because that's really the goal so that we can all go out and execute on pending accounts. But as you might imagine, since there is a 
slide deck up on the screen, I'm going to take a couple of slides to go through what pending accounts are. And again, you can sort of think of in the first order, pending accounts and operating accounts are sort of the same, and then we can get into how they're different. Okay, but at least for this, let's call them the same. So we're in the industry funded, typically also, then there's uh, industry sponsored clinical trial space. Okay, so we're not in federal NIH space, we're in industry space. And what we're going to do is talk about the process for assigning expenses to industry funded clinical trials. Why do we want to do this? One, we want to be appropriate so that where we experience costs in doing clinical trials, those costs are um, passed on to sponsors so they can compensate us for our costs. This is just to be fair and appropriate. Um, this is not necessarily to make a margin, but this is to have sponsors actually cover the costs of the trials they want us to do. So that's really where this is all coming from. So there are gonna be three points from this, and I'm gonna start with those three points. So this is the answer, and then I'm gonna end with the answer. And hopefully by the time we get there, through only five slides, um, the answer may be clear. So if we want to appropriately sign uh, expenses to clinical trial accounts, as we're developing clinical trials in the pre-award space, executing those trials when the trial is active, and then in the cleanup at the end, what do we need to do? We need to communicate the effort and the expenses to whoever your award manager is. Is that pretty straightforward? Good. Um, what does the award manager have to do? Post those expenses to the pending account or to the active account once the trial is going. And I'll explain how pending accounts come into being. So is that okay? And then um, that's the whole point. Um, but you also need to know that if that doesn't happen, when it comes time to get the signature on the contract for the trial, if the pending account hasn't been used, and doesn't have um, the expenses related to the study team, PI, coordinators, whomever, doesn't have those on the pending account, the contract will not be signed and you can't do the study. And that's pretty straightforward too. So would it be worth going through a little bit of the process behind these three points? Thank you. I have someone who's supportive over here on my right who's saying, yes, Bob, get on with it because I have a beer too. So <laughs> I, I got it. I got it. Okay. So what happens? Typically, this is going to be really, I hope, straightforward. Here we are. We're a PI study team. We've got a trial that we're interested in. And you can see documents to OSP as we're setting up to do it. What do we do? We do those six bullets at least. Pretty straightforward. As we're doing that, we're also communicating with our unit award manager, typically in your department or your division. Maybe in cancer center, it might be a little different, but it's your in communication with your award manager. That's pretty straightforward. Once you've done all those documents, what do you do? What's the next step? You go to OSP, right? And you send them, step two is to go to OSP and get those documents there. And what does OSP do? They do two things. And this is where sometimes it's useful to know uh, what's going on. OSP does its job of beginning the contract negotiation with the funder. That's fine, that's their business. OSP automatically, actually OSP initiates, they don't set up the account, but the account called the pending account is automatically set up. Once you have that pending account, so as soon as the documents go to uh, OSP, the pending account occurs, it has an account number. As it goes to an active account, it will keep the same number, so you don't have to worry about that. But before the contract is signed, it's just called pending. So what happens at that point? 
the award manager simply posts the efforts and the expenses that occurred during the preparation for submission to OSB to the pending account. Any um, ambiguity about that? Okay, super. Actually, Dr. Taylor, can I ask a very naive question for those who may not be initiated? What are the kinds of efforts that would be happening in this kind of pre-award stage? Sure. So is that a question, Jennifer, that you wanted to answer? <laughs> well, that's not fair. <laughs> I'm happy to, but- Well, I'll please go ahead. Please go ahead. Well, I imagine there's a lot of effort that goes, I'm oh, sorry. I imagine there's a lot of effort that goes into uh, developing the information, the documentation that goes to OSP. There's probably a lot of effort that goes into some of the regulatory documents, IRB and whatnot, that also need to be addressed. So are those the kinds of team, both faculty and study team members that should be posted to that pending account? That is correct. Okay. So it's in that box on the previous, uh, well, on what was the previous slide. Mm -hmm. Those activities, the time, the effort, and any other expenses that are incurred there, um, those are the kinds of things that get posted to the pending account. Thank you. And then after you send it to OSP, there may be continuing work, uh, which is done in refining the uh, documents for OSP or developing the study. And what happens to that? You're in constant contact with the unit award manager, right? And that award manager appropriately posts those expenses to the pending account. And that's what happens as OSP is working on getting ready for working in contract negotiation, getting ready to sign the contract. Yeah. Are you posting the? No, just Are you posting the effort? Because I guess during that pre-award period, the majority of the expense is effort, right? That's, that's, so, are you posting it on a? You know, it may take five months for the contract to get approved. Yep. So during that five month period, you should have, if you're, I don't know, posting it monthly or however the accountants do that, you should be estimating effort per month, right? And saying however much PI effort, mm -hmm. however much other team members effort mm -hmm. is posted to the, that account, January, February. Is that how you expect to see it yep. on a per month basis? Yep. Okay. And then what you're in, what you haven't said is, well, isn't that account running in, in deficit? Correct. And the answer is yeah. And, and the institution fully understands that. And right. And sometimes there's no effort on our part. We're just waiting. Well, if there's no effort, then you don't have effort to right. post. Now, part of the issue comes up and this will be operating accounts because Oftentimes in all of that space, the PI time, I'd like to think PIs add a great deal to this process, but there might not actually be a whole heck of a lot of time. And that's where we'll talk about operating accounts because I think that's designed to address that issue. So we don't get sort of all tangled up in um, unproductive accounting stuff. Um, we're trying to be very sensitive to that and open to suggestion, but you are quite right. You are posting that effort, okay? So then that goes on. You do so more another work question. and yes. Is this fully costed effort with indirects? I mean. So the, the uh, what would go here is the effort for the actual effort for the people, which I don't think would have, it's a percent effort. Um, so ultimately, when it ends up going to the sponsor, there would be on top of that IDC, but the pending account is to post real effort and percent effort. Okay, thank you. I knew there was a reason other than that that I wanted to pay attention over here, so thank <laughs> you. Okay, so what happens, guys, um, when the contract is ready for signature and the operating account has been used appropriately? Well, a couple of things happen. OSP 
uh, realizes that the contract is ready for signature, they get in touch with the CTAO, that's Mark. Mark looks over at the pending account. And if the pending account has been used, and his job is not to get down to the micromanagement of the pending account, but you know, frankly, right now what we're seeing is sometimes there's no use of the pending account, and that is not acceptable. He's not gonna get into a debate of should it be 3%, 4%, cuz he actually doesn't know. That's up to you and your award manager to make sure that's fair. Um, but he sees that the uh, pending account uh, has been used appropriately and OSP signs it, you're off and running. And then after that, all of the work that you do is the study team working with the award manager that pending account, same number is now an quote active account because it's going to be receiving income from the sponsor. Okay. But you don't have to worry about account number changes. It stays the same. Okay. It's just a change in status. Okay. Yeah. How does the effort on the pending account influence? How does effort on the pending account influence OSP's uh, uh, contract uh, negotiation for the budget? Um, it doesn't. Because when OSP is negotiating, they are not negotiating a budget, they are negotiating contract terms. And contract terms are things like governing laws, subject medical injuries. So we don't have to worry about that uh, with OSP, we have to worry about that on the back end to make sure we're balancing it. That's correct. And actually, those budget negotiations are typically happening with the sponsor between the time of submission to OSP and the contract being ready for signature. So there are two paths. OSP is doing this certain elements of the contract and the study team, at least in the current model, is negotiating budget. Well, I'm putting an asterisk by that so we can come back and, and um, discuss budget at a later time. I just wanna thank Cindy for coming because Cindy is the way I can get away with anything. Uh, <laughs> they might, even if I were to try. Cindy, thanks very much. Um, I haven't gotten into trouble yet that I'm aware of. And Lakeisha is here, my I goodness. For a clarification. Sure. So back to Heather's comment. If on the pending account, you're going to post monthly, if there's a month when they don't have effort, right. they're not doing anything. I think based on the effort reporting policy, PIs have to have a minimum of 1%. Can we come back with that to operating accounts? But if they don't have an operating account, they would have to post 1%, right? So can we come back to operating we accounts? Can. Um, because I think this is where I really wanted to be clear why there are operating accounts. Um, so thank you guys both for coming. Um, so now comes the fun, because this is really the key point, and I want everybody to know this. Um, we hope it never, ever, ever happens, but if it does happen, it's important to know why and what the fix is. So what would happen if the contract is ready for signature and the operating account or pending account and I think just before you guys came, I sort of said, oh, let's, after we do this, let's talk about the difference between those two concepts and how we use them for percent effort, because I think that's really key for PIs. Um, what happens if it has not been used? Does anyone remember <laughs> what the third point on the first slide was? What? Right, the contract will not be signed simple it is a declarative statement of purpose there so what's going to happen contract ready osp turns to mark mark takes a look at the pending account and oops hadn't been used so what does mark do he turns around then he gets in touch with the pi and the study team he gets in touch with the award manager and says guys contract ready for signature i don't see anything in the appropriate stuff in the pending account um, and just an IRB expense doesn't quite cut it. Um, so what's happening? You gotta use the pending account. What else happens at that time? Well, there's another little wrinkle. 
And that wrinkle is that in addition to getting in touch with the PI and the study team, uh, the department chair and the executive administrator of the department is notified. Why? Because if there were an investigator who didn't understand this process, feels that they are being, um, that this process isn't appropriate and decides they wanna go fuss at their chair, the chair is already going to know what's happening and might turn to that investigator and say, gosh, did you go to any of the town halls to explain this? And if the answer is no, then the answer is, the reciprocal answer is shame on you. Let me go through the process or you, know, you can play that through any way you want. But I'm being quite serious. Um, the department chairs and the EAs will be notified, so none of this is a surprise to them. And the fix is just really simple. What would the fix be? Yeah. yeah. Just number five on this slide. You post the efforts, you do that, and then boom, the signature happens. So it's not, it's not that hard, guys. It's just understanding that uh, we've gotten to the point where we feel that we actually have to hold the signature because just making the case hasn't carried the day. Is it okay to put PI effort and staff effort on that same pending account? Absolutely. So you don't have to separate PI effort and staff effort? You don't have to, but the, you're, you're, you're providing a segue into operating accounts. Okay. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, for those of you who are following it, absolute details of the conversation. It's the appropriate question and it wasn't a plant, um, but it is appropriate. So um, one of the issues that's come up is, um, especially from a PI perspective, oftentimes PIs have multiple trials and um, they do have, when you look at the aggregate, you can say, I don't know, I'll make up a number, 10, 15% of their time is on trials, but that's over a whole bunch of trials. And it's really hard to know in any month how much have you spent on trial A or B or C. And, and we didn't want to get into a, a, um, an unproductive sort of accounting space because you can sort of go down on, um, seems like, feels like an infinite rabbit hole here. And so the idea of the pending account is the pending account allows the PI working with presumably his or her division director, department chair, whatever, um, says, you know, it feels it's 20% or 15% of my time is on clinical trials. And that's the way the PI effort is handled. Now, there are some mechanics, which actually Lakeisha and Cindy uh, can explain, and I'm so glad they're here because this is where I don't get in trouble. Um, but it is important to recognize that, you know, there, there are times where, where it's a fraction, of, literally a fraction of a percent, and that's not the point. The point here is to get an authentic aggregate amount of PI effort devoted to clinical trials. There's another reason for many PIs they are working both in the federal space and in the clinical trial space. And when you think of it that way, the vocabulary in those two spaces is very different. Federal space thinks percent effort. Mm -hmm. Clinical trial space is hours worked or units of work. And they're just two different vocabularies. The bridging is done with the operating account. Um, and that's where, let's say you have 20% or 10 or 15, whatever is appropriate in the operating account, then when you have to report to the feds and your other support, you can point to that and that's embodied in the operating account and you don't have to list umpty -um clinical trials. And then when you're um, actually running the trials, then you can turn to another facet. and figure out how the 
um, monies from the individual trials and the operating account work back and forth together. And that's where if there are questions, I would turn to Cindy and Leticia and say, well, actually, how does that work? And I don't know if you want them to expound on this, because you maybe want to. A little comment, or am I okay? I think you're okay if there's not any other specific questions. Can we go back to that question? Because that that's where I'm so confused. Um, so if you use if you're using a pooled account, then you can have a certain percentage of PI effort sitting on that pooled account. So say for example, you put um, five percent on that pooled account of that investigator, and that's reflective of maybe the ten trials that that investigator does. That um, is a way to not put one percent on each active trial. So that's more helpful for investigators that have a large portfolio. But what you have to make sure you do is on the operating account, you make sure that you pick a percentage that is truly reflective of the work that they do. So there's not strict guidelines around it, but if you have 1% for 20 trials, that's probably not appropriate. So you have to use some common sense with it. With the pending account, I think that's where the, the question might be. If you're gonna go with not utilizing operating account and using a pending account, based on the effort reporting policy we have in place in regards to PIs, they have to have a minimum of 1% effort on the account, even on the pending. Right, and Cindy's right. And so typically what happens is, is that that pending account actually turn, I probably don't even need a microphone. No, okay, do. got it. Okay, so do I need to get in front of this? Okay. So um, what happens is, is that the pending account actually turns into your active account, right? For the study. For the study, okay. right, or for the grant, right? And so that Cindy's correct in that the effort reporting policy, and if you hadn't had an opportunity to go out and take a look at it, please feel free to do that because it's very prescriptive in terms of what the expectations are in terms of effort. But to Cindy's point is the operating account allows you to not have to be so prescriptive in that, listen, I'm using one account for effort reporting purposes. Um, and you're looking at it on over a larger period of time uh, that will allow you to be able to appropriately place effort on um, the GA account, whether industry or federal. Um, that's appropriate in terms of um, the level of effort and work and activity that the PI is doing. Is that helpful? It is. Okay. So basically you're saying if you choose not to use an operating account, then you have to account for their effort monthly. And like when it's sitting over in contracts and it's back and forth and the PI's not really doing anything, mm -hmm. you still are going to have to account for effort. Yes. So that makes that complicated thing to do and maybe easier to use the operating account. Correct. Exactly, because the fact is, is that although the contract is sitting in OSP, that doesn't mean that they have not done any work, right? right? Because they have. Likely, right. they probably have. But I think to the conclusion you've come to, that in most circumstances you would want PIs, working with an operating account is spot on. Um, the magic number of 1% represents um, in part, the fact that that's the smallest number our accounting systems can handle, but also when you get down to parsing per, a fraction of a percent, it's not clear we're, we're spending our time wisely um, in terms of all that we have to do. So I sort of view the operating account, especially for PIs, is the aggregate effort has to pass what I call the sniff test. And you know, you, you maybe can't parse that to three decimal places, but you sure know when it's pretty much on target, and you know when it's pretty much not on target. And that's the goal, is to give us a, a mechanism, excuse me, to give us a mechanism where um, we have something that's easier to use, that recognizes the breadth of portfolio that PIs often have, um, and satisfies the requirement whether we're looking over into federal space or we're looking over into clinical trial space and, and trying to do the right thing. Please. There's a, there's a hybrid uh, 
trial funding uh, mechanism where a drug company would uh, provide $100,000, but it's an investigator initiated study. How is this treated differently? Um, maybe they give you some drug and some money, but it's not an industry sponsored trial. An industry funded trial. And it's fully industry funded conceived trial. So how is your effort being supported? So in some cases, uh, the trial may be under budgeted because of these mechanisms. Is, is right. That's really what I'm getting at. No, and then I come back with the same question: How? How? Okay, so then it'd be the department coming in with correct. that. Okay. Correct. So it would still be on through the same, and have to have the one percent on there. Well, uh, I mean, I can't imagine if I had a portfolio of clinical trials. I can ima cannot imagine not using an operating account. But if you want to use a, pen, a whole portfolio of pending accounts at 1% minimum per month, that's your option. Wouldn't be my recommendation, but it's up to you. You, de you decide. And frankly, as we've worked with investigators, um, frankly, to my surprise, some have said, I want to use operating accounts. And I go, okay. Um, but again, this is work with your, not only with your unit award manager, but also with folks within your department uh draw on expertise from cindy uh Lakeisha, from mark um the goal here is to help us all make it as easy as possible to do the right thing and the resources are there um for help so can i ask any other questions at the moment maybe the next question is what do you does anyone imagine what the last slide on this deck is Ah, fantastic <laughs> exactly it's really it's very straightforward guys and and the point is um so nobody we hope we never have to hold the signature but if we do it shouldn't be a surprise and so for all your colleagues uh, who haven't been able to make um any of the town halls or haven't been in a number of the executive, uh, working with executive administrators, uh, Cindy working with PIs. There have been a lot of different venues in which we've discussed this. Um, but we just want to make sure that there have been lots of ways to learn about what this process is going to be about. OK? Now, what I don't know, Katie, what's the next slide? You made this deck. Ah, look at that. Um, has anyone, um, uh, is everyone aware of the recommended sort of, uh, about the conversation about fair and appropriate budgeting and the, the expected upfront costs that are sort of fixed and the recommended upfront costs? Is everybody aware of that? So I see a lot of yes. So could I ask, um, is this where I step aside so you can see the entire august audience out here? Let me ask for, um, we actually have a lot of national data about what happens in this space. Um, does anyone know what the national average is for startup costs for clinical trials? Guess? Anyone brave enough to... I hear 20s. 28,000. 28, 20s, somewhere in the 20s. Um, any other guesses? Anyone else brave enough to mention a number? Especially those who are not working on the Encore team, John? <laughs> okay, so I'm hearing something in the 20s. Anyone willing to wager what the average startup costs are? in looking at the UAB clinical trials portfolio. So I'm asking, we're setting up the question of this is the national average, and I would tell you there's not much regional difference, and what's the UAB average? Anyone care to, to guess? I hear eight. Going for six, going for 10, <laughs> any, what else? Anyone else with a guess? Eight is just about right. Right now, we're at about $8,000. So um, I would just ask us for a moment to reflect on some math. 
we know not only in our region, but nationally, and the range is actually, and this is based on 637 sites around the country, the range is between 20 and $30,000. We know that the average at UAB is eight. Does anyone see a disconnect? I would welcome suggestions as to why and what we do about that. Thoughts? So let me frame it a little bit differently. What we are doing as an institution, though we don't typically think of it this way, we as an institution are subsidizing the pharmaceutical industry. Would anyone here like to see that as a headline in the newspaper? All those in favor say aye. Okay, Meredith, you are having fun back there. Um, so I don't, I don't quite get it, quite honestly. Um, you know, initially when we were, when we got the local uh, data, and we've done it several different polls of UEB data at several different times. Um, an optimist would say, "Hey, we're making progress. We moved from six to eight. Okay, that's it's good. That's a thirty percent increase." Um, but I'm trying to understand how it is, why it is that we are so different from the national average. And I really need help because this is the way to communicate, um, not only to all of the investigators and investigative teams around campus to say, look, this is appropriate. Um, make sure that you consider all these activities in your startup costs. And by the way, here is not only um, UAB-based information of what we know pharma will support. So the issue with, oh, no, 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 they won't do it. That's just not correct. We know, based on actual budgets that have been funded, we know what that is. So anyone have suggestions as to what we do? So this is a little bit, as you guys are guessing, I hope you're guessing, this is a little bit of a call to action. And I realize that all of you are serving different roles in the investigative teams, but um, insofar as you can within your team, uh, when you get to um, putting together the budget, understanding not only um, how, what items should be in the budget, but also how we should fairly and appropriately monetize those is our real costs. Um, we have those information, that information available. Has anyone seen those, what I'll call the standardized budget sheets? I'm actually seeing only a few people say yes. Is that, is it true that you guys haven't seen them? They've been available for, Thank you. No, I, but you know, I'm sorry. I had to discount your answer because you were the one who knew what the next slide was going to be. So that means you are three steps ahead of the game, um, or at least one slide ahead of the game. Um, so let me put it differently. If there's anyone who hasn't or doesn't remember, um, what would be the appropriate email to use? Uh, we can use okay, send an email saying, I want it, and we will get it to you. Um, it's been reviewed umpty um times. It's been vetted against both regional and national competitors. It's been compared to what we know units, various units at UAB are already doing and getting. This is a hat tip, by the way, to pediatrics. They just knock the socks off of everybody else. And for them, they're lowballing in 20 to 30,000. Um, but they do it and they get the studies. But we'll get that information to you because there are two kinds of things um, that that information contains. First of all, what you can, what you not only should expect, but will experience as upfront costs. Um, that will then go to support the IRB and other things like that. But then also 
a sheet of all the activities with at least um, expenses you might consider because they have been vetted. <coughs> In doing this, there are two kinds of work um, that have been uh, quite a while in the making. Um, but I think it's important for us to realize this was actually a heavy lift. First of all, um, there's been several national surveys that we've done calling our buddies at different institutions using the primary source of information as CTSAs around the country. So you probably know there are about 64 of them. We've got information from a lot of them saying, what do you do in your shop um, to make sure that we are fair and appropriate? Um, the other is we have done, and this is the royal we, um, not me. Um, we have worked very hard with UAV uh, to develop what we call the Charge Master, which allows you to know for when there are clinical billables, this is what you can expect as the charge. So um, that, you know, if you come up with some funky new test, that won't be on the Charge Master. But the vast majority of what you do. Um, will be on the charge master. And I believe, John, that's an encore. So this is where you can go to get this information. You will know what the charges are. And I hope that will help you construct a fair and appropriate budget because it, I would have thought it might be helpful to know, well, this is the charge I'm going to experience for an EKG or a CBC or something like that. Um, and then if a sponsor says, oh no, your charge is too high, you can say, um, no, this has been vetted and endorsed not only by the health system, but a number of the charges um, have, have been reviewed by the university, by the health system, by the School of Medicine, and so on. So I'm gonna look for, yeah. So this whole issue of um, uh, budgeting, and we might even think the change from 6,000 to 8,000 really started back two and a half years ago. Did anyone uh, come to the forum, which was back on July 15th in 2017? Yeah. Okay. So, and if anyone is interested, you know, are we really authentic or is this just, well, I won't go there. That, that gets to a larger national discussion. If you want to see that presentation, it's up in the CCTS YouTube channel. Um, and of course you want to go to that channel and that's the web address for that presentation. And what we talked about there uh, was what is fair and appropriate in the clinical trial space. The experience around which this presentation was built uh, was the cystic fibrosis space, where at least historically the cystic fibrosis effort had been, um, was having a significant negative balance in their books and having trouble um, keeping people there because, you know, business up, business down, there was a lot of fluctuation. Cystic Fibrosis Foundation came in and helped them uh, improve their processes. And I think the bottom line was, um, now they're on a much more even keel. Is that fair to say? Yes. Right. And was that hard to do? It wasn't. I think a lot of it was just a lot of just education that we didn't have and not really understanding, like you said, what we could charge for, that we, we were giving a lot of work away and not realizing that we were doing so. Right. And, and you can think if you're, if you're a CRO mediating between a pharma and a clinical trial site and you are willing to give work away uh, gratis, um, somebody wins, then they may not point that out to you that that's going to happen. So I would encourage us to think about um, those two sheets. If you haven't had them, please ask for them. We'll get them out to you so they can help build budgets. I would also say one of the things that's become very clear is that amongst all of us, some of us are really good negotiators. 
did one of the negotiators who was standing back there step out for a minute? Um, but frankly, not all of us are really good negotiators. It's, it's, a, it's partly a skill, frankly, it's partly a personality. And so it's important to recognize that and to make sure that the people who might be negotiating with um, pharma are people who are good at it. And again, this is to be fair and appropriate because actually when you realize that we have been operating, at least classically, it's somewhere between a $14,000 per study and $24,000 per study deficit, somebody's been taking advantage of us. And that doesn't feel very good, quite honestly. Um, so just some points. Um, any thoughts or questions about that? Yeah. I that's a really long URL. So back up one for me, Dr. Kendall. Back up one slide. Oh, now you're now you're. So if you just search for that the title, you'll find it. Okay. You want to either take a picture of it or write it down or whatever, and then our YouTube channel is not. So I, I think everyone is also badged in, right? So if you haven't, you might want to, and that way we can make sure that you can find all of the slide decks, the URLs, and all of the other information that we've talked about tonight very easily. Well done. Mm -hmm. Can I make a comment? Please do. So um, I just was the recipient of an informal survey of cancer centers. And just so that you, you, you know this, so the first question on the survey to, that went out to all cancer centers, how often are you told that you're the highest cost clinical trial center ever? And it's about 90% of us get that message. So that's just a negotiating tactic. So if they're telling you you're the highest cost, it's a negotiating tactic. We are not the highest cost. You should ignore that. Same thing with your, you know, you're the slowest. We're also not the slowest. Um, so, so we're not the highest cost and we're not the slowest. But so. we do want to be the fastest. fastest. Yeah. But, but just realize that they're, they're, you know, especially if you're dealing with a CRO, but any, any of them, they're, they're trying to reduce their costs. So they're going to tell you that you're more expensive. Um, that's, that's negotiating number uh, 101. So don't fall for it. Go back several times. Yes. And I think, you know, quite honestly, one of the comments I get uh, or have heard from some folks is, well, gee, if we were to ask for these, um, these real costs to be covered, pharma would walk away. And I think if I'm remembering the July presentation is the answer was yes, sometimes they will. And two weeks later, they will come back. And so you just have to be willing to collectively, we have to recognize that sometimes I walk away and a few may stay away. But, you know, somewhere between fourteen dollars and $24,000 a study, it just, it doesn't compute for me. And I hope that you guys um, will get a, um, a little bit of a sense of, of what we are providing to pharma. We want to be good, fair, and appropriate partners to pharma. The goal here is not to be inappropriate with them, but equally, it's not for them or the CRO in between. Because if they lowball us, that's money in their pocket. They don't return that to the sponsor, I promise you. Um, so that's just so you know. Um, it's so that we are fair and appropriate. That's the goal. So, uh, one of the questions that comes up um, sometimes in this space is, okay, Bob, where do I go to find out about all of this stuff? So, where would you go to find out about it? Yeah, it's a little bit of a challenge. So, um, <laughs> in preparation <laughs> for the town halls last week, I um, enrolled myself in an experiment, uh, which I didn't have IRB approval for because I don't intend to publish this. I challenged myself to find this stuff and I couldn't. So I reached out to colleagues, thank you very much, and say, where the 
is this? How can I find out this information? Where are the policies? Where are these documents? Where can I get help? Um, so we have a partial answer to that question. Um, there are sites, perhaps a little bit dis distributed um, across web, UAB web space, and these are some of them. And, it, and if you'd like, if you send to ccts at uab.edu, UAB um, if you send us a please send, we'll send you this. But can I ask the question slightly differently? Would it be helpful to have a somewhat more cohesive way or cohesive place to find this? Is there anybody who would vote for lack of cohesion in this? You know, this is one of the questions. I've never had a unanimous answer uh, to most questions posed, but I think we just heard a unanimous, we've got to pull it together. And joking aside, I think it's really important. And so we're gonna think through how we do that. You know, there's some, sorry, this is likely scam likely. At least I'm, it is <laughs> scam likely. Um, we'll pull that together. Can I ask an, another question? Had to answer that, even though the probability was 99% scam likely, the 1% probability I had to answer, so I had to check. Um, what are the other ways? Can you make suggestions to us as to ways in which we can more effectively communicate what's happening, maybe where some of these documents are? Um, would it be helpful? A couple of ideas. Would town halls, gatherings like this be useful on a regular basis? We don't want to duplicate what's already happening, but in the lunch and learn, for example, we don't have quite the amount of time to explore some issue, issues and answer questions. It's more of an FYI. So please think about that. Would it be helpful to have uh, um, maybe a monthly bulletin that comes out as a newsletter, maybe a variant of, something that comes from the school or something that comes from the CCTS, or we, we can frame it whatever way we want. Uh, would it, what would be helpful? We're, we're totally open to suggestion because I think one of the things, um, as we work through the clinical trials initiative, we found that getting the information out is really one of the major challenges. So what, what would you think? What would you suggest we do? Thoughts? So, oh, a couple of other things. First of all, can I introduce uh, Katie Bradford? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> so, Katie uh, has volunteered to at least pilot test, uh, we'll call it a bulletin, um, to see if it works, to see if it helps, uh, this kind of information, getting it out. Um, if it works, great, we'll continue. If it doesn't work, let us know and we'll do something else. But Katie, thank you very much uh, for doing that. What do you think about more very topically focused meetings like this? Useful, not useful? Yeah? Why would you have adult beverages? Very useful. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, one of the problems with having to speak is the adult beverage sits over here. <laughs> but yeah, we, we will do that. Um, and then, what would be really helpful is what should we be discussing together? What are the issues? Um, and then we'll figure out what the solutions are. We've got a list of interesting challenges um, that as we go through this process, we've identified, but it's important for us to be able to prioritize those for what's meaningful to you. Um, so that kind of feedback would be hugely helpful. Um, what else? Anything else you can think of? I, I think there's a, a, a broad. Um, I think when I when I interact with investigators, um, there's a, a a broad level of um, a, a lot of variability in their knowledge about clinical trial conduct, budgeting, things like this are complete black boxes. So yep. 
I think a very um, explicit, um, maybe an online course with some very short videos and here's some more recommended things, things that we want investigators and uh, new clinical staff to know uh, about our enterprise and how we do clinical trials. If it's something you can do on your own time, that, that to me would be valuable. Um, okay. And then you could deeper dive in, in areas that you need it. But I think there's a lack of knowledge across our research enterprise on a lot of these things if you're not doing it every day. Couldn't agree more. Um, Meredith, did you want to make a comment? You, Meredith and Cindy, I'm sorry. I'm, I have to step out here to see both of you. We're working on CITP. Um, you know, just a basic course um, for young investigators early in their careers, but we've also see a need for continuing education where we would post videos, but we need topics. So any topics that you could send our way, we'll make sure that those that videos are posted. We would do it on the learning system so we could keep track of who's um, viewing those videos. And then we want a forum where they can come to us and say, we want more information about, and then we provide them. Cindy, additional comments or thoughts? Okay. Um, one of the things I, I would add is uh, one of the um, missions of the CTSA program is to pull together best practices. This is one, but not the only space they're in. Um, on a national level, there's actually quite a deep um, digital literature out there. It's, it, these are not papers, these are videos and things like that. And we will be um, drawing from that as well so that there is a portal one can go to. Um, this is another communication opportunity um, to see if we can't make it easier to find out what's going on. Maybe as a last thing, um, is there, are there any other burning issues? For folks? Yeah. Um, just one question or a suggestion. Um, today we discussed at a meeting, a lot of people have different ways to effort report since that's a lot of what we're going to be doing. If you guys have a template that would be nice to have for new or upcoming people say, this is how you do it, pull it from here with the formula buzz calculations already there. Okay, good. Thank you. And, and that's something that we may be able to actualize through working with the uh, financial the award managers and the exec executive administrators. Um, has anyone ever uh, in a negotiation encountered um, some, some comments from a sponsor which is basically, show me that that's your policy? Um, so there are some documents that are actually in UAB web space that will point to some of that. But I'm going to open up, um, I'll just make the commitment. If, if you need more letters than what's already up there posted, so I think a number of the upfront costs from an institutional perspective are up there over the signature of Chris Brown, Selwyn Vickers, and myself. But if you need something more, let us know. And we will get you that letter. It, it's, we do not want the lack of such a letter uh, to be an issue. And assuming what you're proposing is reasonable, we'll simply write that letter for you. So they, uh, it's a, a way of saying directly to everybody, we've got to pull together as a team, as an enterprise team, and we've got your back. Um, and if we do that, I think we're going to find that we can do a lot more. And then finally, the last thing, I'm seeing a few people wearing 5226 buttons. Anyone know what that means? Okay. This is my 30-minute pitch um, <laughs> that I'll try to get down to three minutes. Um, when Yale University tried to con not only tried, but did come together more consistently in their clinical trial space to do things consistently across teams, including budgeting, they found that for the same book of business, they were able to increase their upfront budgets by 52%. That's actually published. 
So this is, this is not apocryphal. This is published and they documented. It's been discussed a lot in the Forte community. The Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, I think when they went around, because some of you may not know, the CF Foundation um, has required for sites to be able to participate in CF Foundation sponsored trials. They have to go through, uh, what would we call it, a site certification process, uh, which is, has both an educational component. Uh, this is how you do it, and you do it well. Um, and as part of that, um, they found that 26% of invoiceables, so things that were already in the budget, efforts, tasks that were performed, were never sent to the sponsor for reimbursement. 26%. So 52, 26. Anyone good at math? And can you figure out what the implication is for your revenue stream? Who said that? Did you just do the math? Or did you divide 52 by 26? <laughs> Both are true. You double the revenue. So last thing, and then, then there's still food and stuff like that back there. Anyone know what the book of business for clinical trials at UAB is right now? Approximately. I'm sorry, I can't parse federal and industry, so I'm gonna conflate the two, so that's the upfront disclaimer. Does anyone know what it is? It's $39 million. So if we take your math, apply it to $39 million, what happens? It doubles. So anybody who says that clinical trials lose money and that we shouldn't be in this space, um, I welcome further conversation about someone who wants to think about that. We are leaving a huge amount on the table. And the purpose of doing the trials is not simply to make money. That's not the point. The point I'm trying to make, guys, is that we, we don't have to take a position where we're concerned about we're asking for too much. We're asking for too little. We are not being fair to ourselves. We want to be fair to our patients. We want to execute on our mission. Part of our mission is to bring new treatment and therapies to the patients we serve. This is the way we can do it. And I still think cystic fibrosis is a wonderful example because that uh, therapeutic space has been revolutionized in the last couple of years, both through innovation at the pharma end, but then careful and, and uh, really just first-rate execution of clinical trials. And everybody ends up winning in that. So that's really the key message for today. Yeah. I was just telling Alan that it pays well to see the statistics of sex. You mean their transformation process? How did they do it? What was just happening in the time period from when we got together to. So I, I know this only by hallway conversation with the person who led it at Yale. It, it did take time, but it was less than a year. Um, but then Yale took a sort of position where I think the leaders at Yale said, this is what we are all going to do together. So it was a combination of recognition from the bottom up and direct support from the top down. So if it took Yale a year, just think of the date. Just a thought. So I would encourage us to say, hey, look, if Yale can do it, we can do it. Why can't we do it? Why shouldn't we do it? Because um, we can. We're showing that we can do it by little steps. I'm encouraging us all to take slightly larger steps because uh, we can get to a space where everybody, and frankly, our patients win. And that's the most important thing. <laughs>